Uh, but it is amazing to see how artificial intelligence is really driving uh, businesses and health uh, going forward. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, the panelists, and then we're going to jump into some questions. So first we have Erica Barnell. Uh, she is the Chief Scientific o Officer and Co-Founder of Genoscopy. Erica, uh, as the co-founder and an Arch Grants winning life science startup uh, that re uh, leverages, I'm going, to, I pronounce, I'm going to work on this pronunciation, eukaryotic? Eukaryotic. Say it again. Eukaryotic. Eukaryotic. Okay, biomarkers to non-invasively diagnose, assess, and treat gastrointestinal disease. Erica leads clinical strategy and research and development. Prior to founding Genoscopy in 2015, she worked at the Washington University School of Medicine to develop non-invasive diagnostic tests to evaluate children in Africa with environmental intranopathy. I did not take science. Psychology was so, they, psychology, we didn't have these like fancy words. Uh, Intranopathy diseases. She started her career as a research technician at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, where she was engineering staple food crops in Africa to be more nutritious. Erica graduated from Cornell University with a dual BS in biological sciences and applied economics and management. Currently, she is in her fifth year of the MD-PhD program at the Washington University School of Medicine, where her PhD concentration is in genetics and genomics. Give a big hand to Erica. <laughs> Next to Erica is Jim Everlin, uh, CEO and co-founder of Top Ops and Gainsight. Uh, as one of the region's most renowned serial entrepreneurs, Jim is on his third phenomenal high-growth startup. Jim's first company, Host Analytics, a leading provider of cloud-based enterprise performance management solutions, founded in 2000, received significant West Coast VC funding and relocated to the Bay Area. Host was acquired by a private equity fund, Vector Capital, in January of this year. In 2011, Jim moved on from Host Analytics to, gain, uh, to found Gainsight, a leading consumer success platform whose investors include Bain Capital, Summit Partners, and Battery Ventures. His latest venture is Top Ops, a sales pipeline management and forecast predictability solution that uses machine learning algorithms to bring clarity to the sales pipeline, accuracy to the forecast, and alignment to the sales process. Jim was the 2015 Missouri Governor's Award recipient for Entrepreneur of the Year and is chair and council member of Arch Grants. Big hand for Jim. And finally, all the way down at my left is David Karandish, CEO and co-founder of Jane AI. Uh, David is a serial entrepreneur, co-founder of the Equity.com Incubator, and co-founder slash CEO of Jane AI. He sits on the board of Varsity Tutors, Create a Loop, and Prepare AI. Before founding Jane AI, David was the CEO of Answers Corporation. David and longtime collaborator, collaborator Chris Sims started the parent company of Answers in 2006 and sold the company to a private equity firm in 2014. He's a computer scientist with 18 years of experience building technology companies focusing on online advertising, SaaS, and artificial intelligence. The awesome David. All right, so my job here is to serve you up questions, and your job is to serve knowledge. Can we do that? Let's do it. Jim, the first one's coming to you. Uh, what part of artificial intelligence has, 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 what part has artificial intelligence played in the three companies that you've founded? Um, the three, let's see, so AI has played a part in each one. Like, I mean, what I did basically is, in each company, found a business process that needed improvement and actually developed a company out of it. So in the case of um, Host Analytics, I had a consulting company before that, and we put the very first uh, finance application in the cloud for, for its finance domain. And um, at that point, it was a subscription-based, so um, I, I came up with the next idea, which was a customer success solution. Just curious, how many people uh, heard the term customer success. Is that more mainstream now, or is it still okay? It, 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 so I, I'm I'm thinking back in the mid 2000s. Sorry, <laughs> where it wasn't so uh, mainstream. But um, but yeah. So we had to win our customers back at Host Analytics. So now uh, I came up with a a way to uh, make sure that your customers are adopting and uh, that they're renewing. And then from there, uh, I got back to you know I think of Erica that does 
so much good for the world for what she does, and I'm, I'm more of an evil profiteer that helps salespeople. <laughs> But uh, it's balanced. yeah, I, it's I, balanced. We, I, I wanted to attack the problem. We were, I had to face a board of directors, um, you know, because we raised a bunch of money for, for um, uh, host analytics and Gainsight. And so, um, you know, every deal I presented, I'd, you know, it was like, these are lock solid. I'd win about half of them. And, uh, um, and so I wanted to make sure that we could apply this AI technology to help us predict which uh, deals will close in the forecast, and in addition, help sales reps. So, um, so yeah, that's how that's really what what goes into it. I used to have to fax my sales reports to my regional manager. I would have, and I just made up my predictions. Everything was 90% close rate. Uh, David, how about you? How 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 important is AI, machine learning, etc., in your business models? And then Eric, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah, so uh, obviously in Jane AI, we are providing artificial intelligence to enterprises to help them access all their company intelligence. Uh, so I'd say AI is pretty critical on that one. Uh, but even across the rest of the, the organizations I'm involved with, uh, Varsity Tutors, as an example, is using artificial intelligence to uh, select the right tutor for the right student at the right moment. Uh, I even think about what we're doing with Create a Loop, uh, teaching kids computer science with a one-for-one -one model. Uh, we're introducing those kids to AI-based concepts as young as third grade. Uh, so I, I think AI is permeating uh, just about every organization I'm involved in. Erica, what about you? Sure. So the impetus for why I started Genoscopy stemmed from an experience I had in the hospital during my first year of medical school, where I met a woman who was 52 and she was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. And it's kind of a ridiculous concept because if you are diagnosed at early stage or as a precancerous lesion, this is a curable disease. And I looked into why is this not possible? Why are patients not getting screened early? Why are we not catching colorectal cancer at early stage and curing these patients? And the reason is patients are non-compliant with existing screening guidelines. And for non-invasive methods that patients are willing to do, the detection of precancerous lesions is very low. And so we integrated machine learning into our process such that the transcripts that we're evaluating can harness the power of this machine learning application and we can detect precancer and these early stage lesions to actually prevent colorectal cancer development for patients like the 50 year old woman that I met in the hospital. So it's, it's using it's pattern detection and identifying some, some markers that, that could indicate uh, cancer, correct? And pre-cancer. And pre-cancer. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, for I'll, I'll open this up to anybody to, to answer first. Um, but how have AI enabled? How has a artificial intelligence enabled new business models for you? Uh, new ca that will allow you to differentiate your business model maybe from a competitor's business model. Well, okay, I'll start off where. With us, before us, like we sell to sales leaders, and before us, um, you know, they had, you know, there could be an army of data analysts that would dig up the data and do reporting, uh, use BI tools. So, uh, so the, the BI tools and reports tell you the what, but AI can actually pre predict and prescribe. So uh, now there's a whole lot more to that, but that's, but you, you know, that's essentially what. Uh, um, you know, what we do as far as transforming um, what sales leaders did before. David, you were going to mention something? Yeah, and I, I don't know that I'd say it was an entirely brand new business model, but I think the combination of software as a service with artificial intelligence is a, kind of like uh, peanut butter and chocolate. Uh, they tend to go, go together really well because uh, you're able to deliver uh, a significantly highly scalable application to help people in areas like customer support, um, onboarding, training, lead generation, sales enablement. Uh, and so that the idea of being able to have a predictable, um, predictable on-ramp, predictable spend, uh, predictable investment to go uh, tackle some of those areas fits very well with the uh, software as a service business model. Erica, you have something you want to add? Yeah, one of the things that I'm most interested in is the application of machine learning to medicine. And this was described effectively by Eric Topol in Deep Medicine, but 
he mentioned that we can actually start using AI to perform some of the mundane tasks that physicians have to do to keep up with regulations and um, reporting. And that would give physicians more time to be able to interact with their patients and speak to them and kind of bring that holistic medicine back to what we used to be able to do 30 years ago. And I'm, I'm very excited about that application specifically in medicine. That's almost counterintuitive, right? Like using machines to get back to a more holistic, wholesome part of medicine. And that, that leads me to this next question about consumer adoption and fear and uh, just people's perception of artificial intelligence. Can you talk a little bit about your company's experience in terms of how comfortable your customers are with AI? Are you seeing fear? Are you seeing adoption? My wife will unplug Echo and Alexa because she doesn't want people listening. Like, what what is this? that you have to overcome. And, and Jim, why don't you start, since you have cons customer success as part of your previous ventures. Yeah, I think the fear is that they don't believe it. Like in mine, it's, it's usually improving a business process, like customer success is about, you know, uh, warning when customers are gonna leave. Um, and now especially with, we give, we give uh, management a sales forecast. So if you're black box about it, if you're like, for those of you that have AI startup, if you have like this black box effect, they're probably not gonna trust it. And at least my market doesn't trust it. And so, um, uh, so we give them the ability to drill down and verify it so that they trust it. Um, and then eventually they just go with what we're giving them. But, uh, but if you don't really support what you're giving them, you, you may never get them to trust. Erica, what about you? Uh, incorporating artificial intelligence in medicine, where does, where's the trust lie, where's the fear? Yeah, and I think most of the patients that are undergoing colorectal cancer screening are over the age of 50, and so the underlying math is not comprehended very well. Um, so they rely heavily, our physicians and patients rely heavily on the data. And I think if the data shows that it's performing well, as well as colonoscopies, they're accepting. Where we run into trouble is with the FDA. So when you submit for FDA approval, you're trying to get cleared by the FDA, they want to know the black box. They want to know the algorithm. They want to understand mm -hmm. it. And so creating a method or an algorithm that can be easily understood by the FDA is one of the challenges that we're having to overcome. And uh, how's the FDA responding to it? They've recently released a lot of guidelines mm -hmm. whereby you can they don't care what you do, what the black box is, but what is the output and what is the variance associated with the output for replicates. Mm -hmm. So I think they're adopting this kind of data-driven approach where they trust that you're doing the algorithm correctly and the output is what really matters, the performance. David, Jane has a very polite name, so like Jane feels welcoming. But are there any fear or adoption issues on the Jane AI side? Yeah, I want to echo what was said from a trust standpoint. Um, you know, if you look at the media, people can get all sorts of ideas on what's going to happen with AI, and uh, some of, some well founded, some a little out there. Um, I think trust is related to a, a concept of transparency. So here's how the system works. Here's what will happen with your data. Uh, here's what is your data. Here's what's our data. That that kind of distinction. Um, and then part of it is that I, I found, uh, maybe, maybe this is anecdotal, but uh, trust goes up as people have been exposed uh, to more AI systems. If you haven't used an AI system, or more likely, if you haven't known that you were using an AI system, uh, then your level of trust tends to go down. Eric, I want to, uh, you're, you're graduating from WashU soon, right? Fifth year? The PhD part. The PhD part. Well, <laughs> Back to okay, there's school. PhD and MD. Like that's your, your doctor. You got the first half of doctor, doctor. Half, first half, yes. First half. Okay. <laughs> uh, but a lot of WashU students. There's a lot of talent in in St. Louis. Uh, you're building a startup here. This question is going to be for all of you. I want to start with Erica, though. Uh, we've heard other panels talk about gender and talent disparity in St. Louis as it relates to talent uh, and, and workforce. What are you noticing? Uh, are you able to find talent here, to look outside of St. Louis? Give us, give the group a, a landscape of what, what it looks like. I think the biggest problem is a lot of these talented individuals are being trained here, but it's hard to keep them here. 
Um, that's traditionally been the problem in the past. I think with the development of the Cortex District, with the development of a lot of incubators around here and potential interest in funding and trying to get funding vehicles to the St. Louis area, that trend is changing. Um, but it is still very difficult to keep the individuals that are being trained here and exceptionally trained at the Genome Institute in the undergrad and at the graduate level um, to keep them here to prevent them from going to Google or Microsoft and things like that. And Jim, we were talking beforehand that you just hired a new C-level person, not necessarily in St. Louis, but how has your talent uh, recruitment been in St. Louis? And if you can, talk a little bit about how you leverage something like Global Hack uh, very early on in Top Ops as, as it relates to talent. Yeah, that was, uh, that was really helpful. So we, I was very fortunate to talk to Gabe early on. Uh, we did the first Global Hack, and, um, and our company was born that weekend, you know? And so I just hired the, um, I hired the top two teams. And, uh, and so <laughs> you could do that back then. But, but anyway, um, yeah, I just, uh, but, but anyway, it was, it was uh, um, I don't know, what was the question now? I got off. Oh, just the talent, to access so to talent. So it's access yeah. to talent. Other okay. than poaching from hackathons, okay. where yeah. else can you find No, talent? it was, uh, <laughs> you know, where it's, it's, some of it is I got the old band back. So I, I had, you know, host, I still got, I got people that have been with me at Host Analytics and Gainsight. Um, always call their CEO first. I never, like Nick Maida, I never, you know, I don't poach people from them. I just, uh, it just worked out that way. But. But anyway, um, so I always get on these side tangents. I'm sorry, I apologize. But um, as far as talent, we, I mean, we went to, uh, we went to some meetups and, that were based on solving some complex problems and we found some people there. Um, we, we did pretty well around here. I think everybody's got a talent problem. And um, you know, I, I, I think if you stick around a dense area like what we have here in Cortex and T-Rex and you know all these areas we, we kind of hang out there go to meetups that where they comp there there's some complex problem they're solving that, that is relevant to what you need um, and <clears throat> you know so that I, I mean we, we did it in a variety of ways you, you gotta you know your network is good that's the best way to, to get people but um, uh, but but yeah I, I feel good about it um, the, as far as like, it's, what's great in my industry in sales overall, they're doing a great job of encouraging both sales and men to get into it. So there's a lot going on there now that makes it easier for us to get a, a good variety of great talent. And so, um, so yeah, it's, I, I think, I mean, I, I have as much of a problem as anybody, but it's, I think overall I'm optimistic about talent locally and just overall. Well, uh, David, I'm going to have you answer this too. Uh, maybe you have some some legacy folks that were with you at Answers that have carried on and, and, and joined you in, in this new pursuit. But as it relates to sustainability, I mean, you have 450, 500 people here that are attending this conference. There was a big conference over at St. Louis University on geospatial happening on the exact same day. That's 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 a lot of talent in conferences. But if these conference goers all start businesses. Does St. Louis have the talent to sustain this growth in this industry? I think it's a great question. Um, there is a lot of talent here in St. Louis, and at the same time, uh, the number of startups we need to plant in this city uh, to stay ahead of all the companies that are getting acquired, uh, it's not so much about where the talent is today as much as where the talent needs to be in the future. Uh, part of the reason why we started Create a Loop is that I, I, I mentioned this in an earlier session on, on diversity and inclusion, but uh, when we were hiring our first six developers at, uh, at Jane AI, we had 237 applicants and we had one African American engineer apply out of that entire cohort. And I, I just uh, I, I looked at that and I said, wow, this is a problem uh, in a city that's roughly 50 50 uh, between African American and white. And so Part of the reason I got so passionate about Create a Loop is that we believe kids should learn computer science no matter what zip code you're in, no matter how much money your parents make or don't make, no matter what your skin color looks like. Uh, and we did something that was a little unconventional. Uh, people told us to start with high school, and we said, no, no, we, we got to start at as young as possible. Uh, so we've got 
cohorts of kids as early as third grade uh, who are learning how to set up an AWS instance or build an Alexa skill or maybe even do some uh, testing for Jane. Uh, so I, I, I kind of look at it as, uh, in terms of the, 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 the talent ecosystem here, I'm, I'm firmly planted in St. Louis. Uh, this is all part of my, I'll call it a 40-year plan. Um, so very, very few people get the opportunity to be able to think in 40-year increments. And so uh, I look at this as the first chapter of, of four uh, around getting the ecosystem together, whether it's uh, the awesome work happening at Varsity Tutors, the teaching kids computer science at Create a Loop, getting this prepare conference off the ground. Uh, and I, I think the other thing that I'd say is people ask me what are the hardest roles to hire for in St. Louis. And we definitely need more engineers and more people thinking like engineers and more computer science-centric uh, folks. Uh, but if you, if you ask me um, the hardest role to hire in, here in, in this particular market would be in the product side. Uh, and the reason for that is that product is an interdisciplinary skill uh, or you need to have one part business and one part marketing and one part uh, computer science and one part data science and one part user experience and one part design. Uh, it, it would be my, uh, well, well, I, I would consider one of my biggest accomplishments to get product design uh, viewed as a real degree, not a side shoot out of the art department, uh, not a kind of uh, minor, but a, but, a, but a real focus on uh, helping to train people in the art and science of building amazing products. Uh, so that's, that's another thing I'm very passionate about. This is an unscripted question, but it has to do with product uh, development in St. Louis. We have a history of uh, CPGs in St. Louis, consumer packaged goods, uh, wh whether it's uh, Purina or AB, uh, the people that are developing products, maybe not on the tech side. Is there any transferability in that skill set over to uh, the tech world? Yeah, I, th I think there, there's definitely transferability. Um, but I, th I think the idea of getting young talent uh, who've studied, pro I, I don't believe that you, most people come out of the womb and say, oh, I want to be a product manager one day, right? If they're talking out of the womb, they probably have other as, as, aspirations, right? Um, but I, I think the, uh, I think product is something that can be taught. It's something that can be learned. It's something that's both experiential and classroom-based. Uh, but you don't want to have to go to a Purina and find someone who's been doing product there for 20 years to go work at a small, you know, small startup. You, you gotta be able to pull people right out of school uh, who can roll up their sleeves and, and get going. And so that, that's why I put such an emphasis on uh, both computer science education and education uh, in the general product sphere. Great, thanks. Uh, let's talk about money for a second. Uh, each of you have raised money or are in the process of raising money or have sold companies to, to make more money. Not a bad thing. Uh, According to Brex, startups, and I mentioned this earlier, startups with a .ai uh, top-level domain have three and a half X the funding at seed stage than companies with .com. Uh, talk about vaporware, right? <laughs> Just register it differently and 3.5X. Uh, we all read that there's a lot of hype around AI. Early stage companies, whether they're proven or not, are getting gobbled up or acquired by Google, Amazon, et cetera, Salesforce. Uh, is the hype real? Uh, or is, is, could the hype be detrimental? If, are we, in the late 90s, we had a dot-com bubble burst because there was a lot of hype based on just having a dot-com. Is that same dot-AI at risk, are we at risk of that bubble bursting? Great. Sorry. Well, I, um, um, yeah, I mean, there's, in my market, like sales and marketing, there's like 7,000 companies now, and it was just a, that are in the AI business for sales and marketing. There's AI for everything in just those two areas. Uh, there was, there were just maybe uh, um, a thousand, you know, not too long ago. And so it's, it's a, there's a lot going on. It's easier to start up a company, um, but I, I still feel that if you've got a simple message and you understand the problem. Um, you'll do well. As far as funding for things like that, um, it, you, 
you got to have more than just a simple message, though. It, <laughs> you you got to you got to grind it out. But um, as far as funding, they've got. Uh, depending on the VC firm, they have uh, uh, specialists in different areas. There's you know voice. There's uh, um, you know a, a number of different areas, including AI. And so um, so yeah, I mean I, mean, I think there there's. Um, there's been a lot of hype, but in the, in the bottom line is when you're funding your company, you have to have some sort of unfair advantage over everything else out there and be able to communicate that to the VC. Erica, let me ask you that same question because, I mean, are there a lot of VC firms that while they have AI and machine learning specialists, they know how to apply it to healthcare, or is you finding that that's a, a, a disconnect? Yeah, I, I was going to mention there was a recent article that was published where they looked at every single publication that stated that they used artificial intelligence or deep learning or random forests for development of an algorithm to predict something in medicine. Mm -hmm. And in all of these studies, regression models, traditional methods for statistics were just as effective as these machine learning models. Mm -hmm. But there has been a huge increase in the number of publications that utilize deep learning and machine learning. And they've also recognized that there's a massive amount of over overfitting mm -hmm. um, so that these applications can't be applied across different universities, different mm -hmm. hospitals. Um, and so I think the biggest problem is not the use of the technology, but the misuse of the technology, not building data sets that are comprehensive, not testing it on external validation, um, not doing your full diligence. Mm -hmm. And I think VCs are just attracted to dot AI, mm -hmm. um, and they also aren't doing the diligence in ensuring that these companies, these technologies are being directly applied in the proper way. David, how about you? What about the hype? You have a conference, so there's got to be some hype that's valid because we're hyping this whole thing. I'm going to be a little bit contrarian. Okay. I think the hype around AI has been underhyped. I think if you look back at the implementation of electricity, and you would have said, oh, this is really nice for lighting up buildings and, uh, you know, putting some very well-meaning candle makers out of business. No one would have fathomed that not that many years later, uh, we would be spending more electricity on mining Bitcoin than, than what was powering the entire country not that long ago. And so... Uh, it really depends. If you think this is a page turn in the history of technology, uh, then it's possible that it's overhyped. But I actually think in the long, maybe in the short run, there may be a little bit of um, overhype on what, what's possible this second. But I think in the long run, we've vastly underhyped what's, uh, what's going to happen out of this revolution. So we have it underhyped. Bye now. Uh, speaking of buying, now raising money. What is your approach to raising money for your artificial intelligence machine learning company? What, what approach do you take? How do you look for VCs? What kind of partnerships are you looking for? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one because this is uh, top of mind. Uh, so we, we took a very different approach uh, this time around. So in my last company, we raised angel funding, uh, and then we went straight to private equity. And uh, we had three private equity rounds. All of that capital, vast majority of the capital came from outside of St. Louis. And so uh, I, I mentioned in my talk earlier that this is the show me state. And so we said, we're not going to raise any outside capital at all until we can prove that we should exist. So part of our equity.com charter is we said, whatever company we launch has to be generating revenue in six months. Now, we're not going to cure disease with that. Um, uh, I would be very bad in a medical startup. Uh, but on month five, day 30, we signed our first client, true story. And so by the time we went to go raise our Series A round, uh, we had a handful of clients who were doing the unnatural act of opening up their wallet and actually paying us for our services. And at that point, we could raise um, a Series A round lar largely on our own terms. We then went out and said, hey, we're going to take a really audacious play at what we think we can do our second year. We think we'll be able to triple uh, our bookings from year over year. And we exceeded that and then went out and said, we're not going to talk with any VCs. We're going to go to individuals. We're going to tell our story. Uh, we're going to talk with a lot of them. Uh, I'm going to be on the road uh, 
uh, doing a lot, a lot of dinners and lunches, and uh, poor Marcus got to sit in a lot of my uh, my pitches to uh, to folks and laugh at my jokes for the 57th time. Uh, Marcus is our CFO. Uh, but yeah, we took a very a traditional route. We're uh, you know on the you know, kind of rounding third base on our Series B round. Uh, if anyone's interested in participating, let me know. Uh, always be fundraising. That was uh, not a solicita direct solicitation. Direct solicitation, yeah, unsolicited. No, but but the um, the thing that we the thing that we learned was that we didn't want to spend a lot of time with people who didn't believe in our story, and so we said, here are our terms. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to personally invest on these same terms, so I'll put my own skin in the game, both in terms of time and, and dollars. And yeah, we've, we've largely skipped the VCs. Now, I'm not anti-VC, VCs can be great, uh, but we looked at this and said, we're taking the long road. Again, I'm, I'm here in this city for a 40-year plan on how to uh, revitalize this and make this a top-tier city. Uh, and so uh, we looked at this and said, we're gonna go in a traditional route, and it's gone uh, swimmingly well. Jim, how about you? How has all this hype, how has the energy around AI impacted your fundraising strategy? So, um, so I mentioned it was like 7,000 in seven sales and marketing. There's three that do what we do, and, and we've been able to prove that it's a significant thing, uh, having a predictable revenue stream and, um, and being able to guide reps on the right kind of winning behaviors. So um, uh, I did have to raise some money to compete. I have two competitors in the Bay Area. Uh, one raised over $70 million. So uh, I can't fall behind. And I, I've always looked at it as it's a three horse race. Uh, my previous company, Host Analytics, they came in third, a distant third. <laughs> but it, they, they had an exit, so we did, that was good. Um, Gainsight is in the lead uh, in, their, uh, in, in customer success. And um, so I, I just, you know, you only have to run faster, what is it? You only have to run uh, faster than the slowest in the herd, you know? So you, as long as you can make that that top three, you can win a market. So, um, uh, and uh, you know, like I said, I think AI is more becoming, uh, it's gonna become table stakes, you know? I mean, you gotta have that approach on, um, uh, when you're developing an application. But I, I look at, I still look at things as solving the business problem overall. And I think AI is an important part of that. And I think that uh, uh, VCs recognize that. And again, um, I, I'm, I better I sum this up, um, but when you're raising money, go as long as you can without raising money, and then only raise it when you, when you have to. But, but take it when it's given to you. <laughs> <laughs> with good terms. Erica, how about you? Yeah, I completely agree with David that you know we wanted people who believed in our mission and believed in the technology, and so our approach was we developed the data, we created this um, cohort of 270 patients, and then we presented the data to healthcare physicians, gastroenter gastroenterologists, um, and basically said we can double the adenoma detection rate relative to our competitor who did a million in revenue last year. So, you know, having that data in hand, showing them the models, showing them exactly what we did, revealing the black box, um, they believe in the mission and they're on board. So it was straightforward. We're going to open it up for questions, but I want, I want one more question or answer from each of you, which is what is the greatest, two, two answers actually, what's a big myth about AI and what is your prediction about the future of AI? And as they're thinking about that, because they, they were not given that question in advance, you also think about some questions you want to ask them and whoever wants to answer first, myth and prediction. Go for it. Yeah. The Biggest myth is that it's a black box. It's so easy to understand if you take the time to understand it. I think a lot of people are resistant because it's new and it seems new. Um, but ordinal regression, machine learning, you know, deep learning is relatively new, but it's been around for a long time. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of information out there. So, so that's the myth. Say? Prediction. Prediction. I think that David mentioned that it might be underhyped. I think the known applications for machine learning are unknown. So I'm looking forward to individuals applying machine learning in a way that we have not yet discovered. Great, David or uh, Jim? 
I'm going to say that the greatest myth is, is just this overall scare that it's going to take over humans. Like in our market, it definitely isn't. It's amplifying the abilities. It's making decisions, but it's like eliminating all these manual little decisions that take up too much cycle times. So, uh, um, so I will say that the, the biggest myth is that it's going to it's going to take over. Yeah, it's going to take over some jobs, but it's, it, I, again, I feel like it's the jobs we don't necessarily want, and we, we're going to like that uh, someone else is doing that, so we can kind of move up. And prediction. Or was that also your prediction? Um, let's see. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, um, AI is going to be in all business processes. Um, it's, you're, you're just going to have to learn these methods and incorporate it into uh, all your development. All right. And David, last word, prediction and myth. I think the biggest myth is that AI is uh, applicable to a workplace three or five years out. I think it's applicable today. Uh, we saw that here in this conference with over 50 different speakers talking about how they're practically applying artificial intelligence in, in a wide variety of industries and areas. Uh, if I want to go a little far out on the prediction side, I think eventually we will all have an AI representation of ourselves. I think the idea of your own memory being confined to your own physical body, your preferences, what you care about, even your own decision making, I think will eventually be encapsulated into an AI platform. I actually just brought all three of these folks on a thumb drive today. Uh, <laughs> all right, questions from the audience? Okay, so quick question. So if each one of the panels could uh, just explain in 15 words or less, what is artificial intelligence? I won't do word count. It's we'll the ability to track data, learn from it, and give intelligent insights from it. Software that learns. You want to try it, Erica? We, we took the only two. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's integration of data into a, a model that can iteratively learn upon itself. Any other questions? There's one up here in the uh, third row. Microphone. There we go. Especially when you look at uh, some of the things that have come out of Europe and California in terms of uh, the concerns that they express about uh, the ability of these machine learning models to make decisions, uh, what do you do about the uh, problem of explainability? Uh, for certain machine models, uh, like a decision tree, it may be a little bit more obvious as to uh, how you explain how a model came to a decision, but especially when you get into some of the deep learning uh, pieces, it's a little less explainable. I think one of the coolest examples of that is um, when they were creating Lord of the Rings, they had this really big um, battle scene and all the orcs were, were going into this castle and storming the castle and fighting. and eventually the orcs who were exposed to artificial intelligence realized that they weren't going to win and so they started retreating because they had this ability to assess that they were outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, etc. And the developers had to force the orcs to continue into battle. Um, and so I think, you know, there are obvious issues with artificial intelligence and with allowing computers to make decisions, but ultimately, you know, the humans are in control of this process, um, and you can create parameters to force models in a certain direction to make the decisions that you want the model to make. 
to ensure that your process is performing properly. There are also issues with allowing uh, humans to make decisions too. So, uh, anybody else in response to that? So, any fans of the TV show The Office? Right. My favorite episode of The Office is when Michael Scott is using Siri to drive his car to navigate, and he ends up driving into the lake. Have you guys ever seen this one? That's a great clip. So it's, it's funny because, of course, Michael Scott would drive a car into a lake because Siri told him to. Um, but it highlights something that I think, I think gets missed, which is uh, if somebody else were to take those same directions, you know, maybe, maybe they wouldn't drive into the lake. Uh, but one of the biggest issues with, with Siri as a platform is that there's very little feedback given back to Apple in terms of was that a good, uh, good response or not. And so to your question on what's going to happen with some of the EU and California regulations, I, I think one of the most important, most fundamental parts of an AI system is the ability for the system to self-correct and take the feedback of the users into account so that you don't make the same mistakes twice. Um, if anyone gets a chance to YouTube that particular clip, it's, it's gold mine. Thanks. All right, we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Yes. Yeah, um, so this is prepare AI uh, number two. And uh, let's fast forward to prepare AI number five. Um, if we continue with this momentum and this interest and, and different cohorts and different constituents being represented here, what does success look like for St. Louis at year number five? How will we know it's working? Aside from more people in this room and you know, little changes on the, on, on, the, on the edge. How will we know it's working another three years from now? Or that's what I'm curious about. I think you, it, when you find the CIC buildings, T-Rex busting at the seams, um, I think when you see a lot more exits, a lot more funding stories, I think that's I think that's a, a good sign. I think when we see investment, individuals and vehicles from the coast coming here specifically to see the companies that we're creating, to see the Cortex District, that's success. They're flying in and being here physically. I'd say two things. One, um, this is a beautiful crowd today. Beautiful crowd, best crowd. <laughs> this but, crowd, this, but this let's, crowd this is the last. I'm I'm one cocktail away from the reception here, so I can go a little off the cuff, right? Right. But let's uh, let's go a little politically incorrect. It's a lot of white meat out here, right? And I, I mean that in all seriousness. Um, I think this organization looks a lot more successful when this room better reflects our city in terms of population and demographics, point one. Point number two, though, uh, I'll respectfully disagree with, with uh, what Erica said. Um, I actually think we'll, we'll be successful when we don't need to go to the coast to go get the next AI startup funded, when we tap into the passive wealth that's in our city, uh, when people are a lot less excited to talk about the Fortune uh, 1,000 companies here, and you see a lot more uh, news, hype, excitement around the next great startup. Well, is there any way to take the content from Prepare AI 1 and the content from Pre Prepare AI 2, dump it into a machine, and mix it all together to predict what it's going to look like in five? Like, isn't that what we're supposed to do here? A big hand, of, big hand to the uh, panelists here Thank today. you all for coming out.